strobes on, P2E, on, cow flaps, set, boost pumps, high, fixtures, bridge, or takeoff checklist complete. No, you no, have I control. Have the, I have the aircraft. You ready in the back? Ready in the back. Hey, engineer set 3-0. Three 3-0 zero. Three zero and we're... Tank shot, 10 seconds. I must break you. Fire! So I am sitting inside a B-29 called Doc in the pilot seat and I never would have imagined that the channel would have taken me to this place and I need to thank Donnie here he's gonna show us uh, a whole walk through of the plane I can't thank you enough happy to do it I'm glad you're here thank you guys for doing this for Don so welcome to a special episode and um, strap yourself in uh, so my name is Donnie Albrighter I'm Doc's flight engineer so you're sitting in the aircraft commander's seat there, and the controls on this airplane uh, is all your arm strength. Your, everything is just cable control. There's no power assist on any of the flight controls. Um, and you're the one that's going to move those massive flight controls and steer this beast where it goes. Uh, Co-pilot over here, and similar controls, just not as, quite as much instrumentation. You can see just the small amount of engine instrumentation you have here. But again, that's because the flight engineer carries the, the load of, of the engine work back there. Yeah. There's a bombardier that sat right there. That was his northern bomb site. And then the B-29C also served as the nose gunner. So this is actually his optic gun control up there that he would have used to zoom in the target and uh, acquire the guns to shoot it down. So Doc actually rolled off the assembly line of Wichita, Kansas in December of 1944. Uh, went into some finishing work for three months and was handed over to the Army in March of 1945. Um, and from there I went to after the war, it was dormant for a little while until it was brought back and denied. And that's the configuration that you see now without the armament in it. And it went into a radar calibration squadron. And what their purpose was, uh, when, you, when you look back after World War II, we pretty much immediately went into the Cold War and we started our umbrella of ICBMs and radar control and stuff. So if we're developing an early warning radar system, you've got to have targets for that, right? So these squadrons of B-29 served that purpose. This one was actually at the Griffiths Air Force Base up in New York, and it was part of a nine-ship squadron that served that purpose. And they were um, all named after Snow White, the Seven Dwarfs, and the ninth one was the Wicked Witch. And <clears throat> so we did that. It was eventually. Uh, sent out to Texas to tow targets, and then in 56 was sent out to the desert to die out of China Lake. So it was discovered and uh, kind of, I would say, rescued in 1987. Uh, it took 13 years for them just to get it out at China Lake. In 2000, um, the airplane was disassembled, brought into Wichita in seven flatbed trucks, just an empty shell, and 16 years later, uh, a lot of very, very dedicated volunteers um, in Wichita 
put this aircraft together, this is the way that you see it today, I and mean, we flew for the first time in July of 2016. So Doc's Friends is a nonprofit organization and with, that oversees the operation and control of the, of the aircraft, uh, the beautiful hangar that they built in Wichita that serves as a working museum for the aircraft, which if anybody's ever in Wichita, you've definitely got to go over to the airport and, and see, see the facility, hopefully the airplane will be there so you can see it as well. But they're the ones that provide the, the oversight, the control, and the support. Uh, we're all volunteers that come in to do this and, and to keep this airplane going for as long as we can. Uh, it's just so important to keep this history alive. And as the years go by, unfortunately, we're losing more and more of our veterans from both World War II and Korea. Um, and we're seeing less and less people understand what this airplane is and what it represents and what the greatest generation did. So that makes it even more important to keep this thing going. And it, it's different to, to see a picture of it in a book or see one in a museum. With this one, you actually get to get inside, you get to listen to it run, you get to smell the smells. And, and if you choose to, you actually can take a flight in this airplane. So on that note, tell us about the schedule. Like if somebody wanted to, to do this, where can they find Doc on flying? So I would recommend going to Doc's website, b29doc.com, mm. and on that it will have the updated schedule throughout the year. Um, if we make changes or additions to come to somebody's city, that's where you're going to see it first. And they also keep their Facebook page updated as well. Okay. Pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer, sit back with your co-pilot over here, assistant controls. Get a navigator over here, radio operator was back there. Where you're standing here, this big ring is where a 4N2 machine gun turret would fit down into the cockpit here. And right there on the floor is where a 2 gun turret would came up from the bottom. So this whole area here would have been filled with armor. The data plate guys out there. That's the original uh, copy data plate of the aircraft. Right, this is the whole hydraulic tank here for this airplane, like we talked about. The only thing on the airplane cut off right now the plates. The only other thing originally was the hydraulic plate. So that was one of those, like we talked about, off the shelf production plates that were stayed there for the time. Same thing B-17s had, they just used that in this airplane instead of reinventing the new one. Pops under the floor right there where he's standing. This is actually the top of the normal brake accumulator. That's what one looks like. The one behind you is actually the emergency brake accumulator. So again, very reminiscent. You can see the B-17 that's in that, right? It's yeah. Probably two or three times the size. So back here, you're the one that has all the controls to start the engine, stop the engines, uh, generators, fuel system. Uh, your flaps over here, and I didn't show you the oil cooler doors, but it, uh, whether it's the cowl flaps and the oil cooler doors that regulate the airflow through there, so you're going to maintain temperature. And then your gauges here, <clears throat> it's not as complex as it actually looks. You have to be a little dyslexic to be in this position here because your left is actually aircraft right. Oh, okay, yep. You with me? Yeah, yeah. Alright, so if you take your gauges, like we've got our tent gauges here, carburetor inlet, cylinder head temperature, oil temperature. Um, you can see how this goes. So instead of you normally look at an airplane control, it's engine one, two, three, four. Well, on this one, again, it's backwards from your perspective, so it's one, two, three, four. And so they'll go down. The rest of these are pretty self-explanatory. You've got the main, um, the main rotating assembly engine oil pressure. Then you're also taking oil pressure off the nose case of the engine. <clears throat> And you've got a tachometer, and these gauges are a little bit different. You've got two needles inside of one gauge, and you can see number three behind number four, and number one's behind number two, so they'll come up and split as this is working. Huh. So you've got aircraft right, aircraft left. Tachometer, manifold pressure, same thing if you guys are running radial engines and tanks, you know what all this stuff is. Mm -hmm. Very same thing, fuel pressure. Um, you know, we've got some flight instruments back here. It's part of the job back here, you're cross-checking. <coughs> airspeeds because different things happen at different airspeeds so you're back here modern in Venezuela. And as far as your engine controls go, this is basically the gas pedal for the airplane. So you've got your throttles. This is your mixture control here. So as you pull these back, this is what's going to they're in cutoff right now, the engine's off. And then you've got settings for lean as well as all the way down to auto rich. So this basically in any of this mode here turns the carburetor on and gets it metering the fuel. And then the speed of your propellers are controlled through these electric switches. 
the feet of governor you can see on the top of the engine mount there on number three you can look at it. And then again, like we talked about in the back, sitting in the seat now, this is your view of what you have. Look out the window. How much can you see at three and four? Yeah, you can see some of it, but can you see small flames that have been coming out of the back of it? And then look out the window over here for one and two. <laughs> Not a great view. Yeah, right, right. So that's why you need the scanners in the back of the airplane to be in the eyes for me. So a couple of questions come to mind. Um, in terms of the, the restoration guys, um, are these modern gauges or are these are like reproduction of the original? Like, do you know? Yes, I do. So these are actually original instruments that have been refurbished. Wow. And as they, just like machines do, as they break whatever, they're, they're either serviced or replaced with other original instruments. The only thing, um, really, no kidding for sure, that is not original. The LED lights for the pitch control right. indication here. Uh, that was done just out of safety because uh, I have to know what, what this is working. And then we've got, we added that battery system you saw in the back of the airplane to the digital gauges out here to monitor the health of the uh, But other than that, the gauges that you're looking at, this is all original stuff. So whoever did this did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's did. very clean. Wow. And then that's true of the entire airplane. those of us more familiar with the, the, the 25 and the 17 and the 24, uh, what what was the reason for introducing this crew member and having a lot of the, the controls move to the rear? And so these engines have a lot more complexity to them. There's a lot of things. I mean, it's all there for the same purpose, but there's so much going on trying to maintain temperatures, uh, maintain control of them, trying to keep this massive propeller synchronized, that the work that goes into making adjustments on that. One person up front can't do all that, but they're trying to wrestle this beast in the air. So there had to be another person back here to actually do that job. This is your control yoke here. Uh, the lock's on right now, and that just helps those cloth flight control surfaces not get beat up in the way. So we'll just talk through it. So you've got your yoke, pull back, steer left, right, up, down. The rudder pedals are here. The top of them, as you push those, are actually end up being your brake pedals also as well when you're on ground. So you've got throttles over there. Copilot has throttles here, and you've seen the flight engine throttles. So. Again, referring to the bombers we know um, a little better, the, it's the first aircraft where the you don't have that forward nose section, the guy's literally right there. So we can talk some about that because that's a good point and I, that question comes off a lot. Why is this airplane shaped the way it is? And if you look at it, it almost looks like a submarine, doesn't it? So this being the first pressurized bomber, how do you contain, best contain pressure, right? It's in a cylinder. And so that's why the nose of this airplane is shaped the way it is. And you've got your autopilot controls from back in the day. Now we, we don't have that going on today. And everything else is all kind of um, as you see it labeled. Now these buttons here are your feathering buttons. And so that, that's kind of an interesting thing to talk about. Again. So what will happen once you get the engine shut down, the fuel cut off, you're going to actually push this feather button. And what that's going to do is activate a massive electric pump that's in that cell out there. And it's going to tap oil off of a separate six gallon oil tank. And it's going to force oil into the dome of the propeller. What it's going to do is take the propeller blades and turn them into the wind to get them to stop spinning. Mm -hmm. And so that will stop the rotation of that engine. So uh, myself and a lot of our viewers are massive movie buffs. And I remember this from the you know, Memphis Bell when they uh, I start arguing about the bombing run. And I, I remember yeah, this. Uh, yeah, he's going to flip it off. He's yep. going to take it back yeah. around. Yeah. yeah. So as they would get close, the, just just like in the movie, it was the same process with this airplane. The navigator with the liner with the autopilot to keep it on target. And then that's again, you guys don't use that function anymore. So. No, no. We're we're trying to keep the aircraft looking as historically correct as possible. Uh, do what we need to to build in reliability and safety. And then you're going to see some things too that are to be compliant with regulatory standards today. Like that's right. not actually a World War II issue iPad. <laughs> <laughs> but most of this instrumentation that you're going to see through here is as it would be So we have Mark Novak, who is one of the pilots of Doc, and he's going to tell us about flying Doc. Tell us 
how does it feel? What's it like to fly a B-29? Um, I tell everyone that it's like flying a pickup truck on a gravel road. <laughs> it's a little squirrely. The ailerons are 25 feet long, so if you like want to make a left turn, the right aileron comes down to lift the wing. First thing that happens, though, you're, when you're slow is the wind hits it and it drags the wing. So the nose will go to the right before it'll actually turn to the left. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get above about 170, 180, it actually becomes a very nice flying airplane. Really? And you can fly three to five foot formation in that. Okay. And um, tell us, like, what what, what is it? Th did you ever see yourself flying something like this? And then when you did... Like the, the emotion involved with that must have been. I was a I was a military guy, so I flew four different airplanes in the military, mm -hmm. and then uh, when I retired, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I'd flown some other World War II airplanes, but Fifi, the other B twenty nine, was needing pilots coming out of its restoration, out of its engine restoration, and they asked me, and I'm like, wow, yes, 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 yes. So I've been doing that now for twelve years. Wow. And um, yeah, what else? What else can you tell us about? Um, I, I think one of the biggest things is people don't realize the crew, <laughs> we fly with six people on a crew. So it's not just the pilot doing his thing, the flight engineer doing his thing. When people fly with us, it has to do with the coordination between everybody. So we have three up front, two pilots and a flight engineer, and then in the back we have three more. Because as a pilot, I can't even see my engines. So they tell me smoke, fire, landing gear up, landing gear down, flaps and all that. So it is a true crew, crew airplane with a lot of coordination involved. Okay. And um, there's obviously that uh, conjecture during the war of bomber pilots and fighter pilots. Have you flown any of the smaller stuff? Oh, I, I, have a, would you... I have a World War II T-6 and my plan was to go fly those pointy, pointy airplanes. But at a certain point, I enjoy flying with other people. Um, I didn't want to be a 60-year-old fat guy pulling G's and this and that. And I, you know, I, I really genuinely enjoy working with the crew and, and bringing a, like I said, a piece of history out to, to the people. Absolutely. So. All right. Cool. So the question was asked. There are only two airworthy flying B-29s left, Fifi and Doc. This gentleman has flown both. He knows them intimately. So. What would you say about flying the same kind of plane and the, the personalities between the two of them? Um, it, it, the perfect word, personality. Every airplane's different. We actually have our flight engineer, and he talks about the engines. He says they're just like kids. Um, you know, they may be from the same maker, but they uh, they all act differently. Um, Fifi tends to fly a little bit heavier, and, and part of it is because she is heavier, a little stiffer, a little on the, harder on the controls. Doc is a newer airframe. I mean, Doc was a complete rebuild, and she's only five years old. Also comes down to how they operate the airplane. Uh, Fifi goes out, leaves in May, and doesn't come back till September, October. And I said, Doc, we tend to go out for three or four weeks at a time. We go out, we come back, so we're not fully loaded. We, we, uh, it's just different. They, I said, I told me they're just different, but they're close enough that uh, they're, they're very similar, you know, in, in the monkey skills. I always get the question. Um, you know, which one do you like better? And I always say, you know, you really shouldn't talk about your girlfriend in front of your wife. So uh, um, I, I love them both, and I'll fly them both. And I've actually flown both of them over 300 hours each. So. Legend. Thanks. <laughs> 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 So the, the Norden bombsite, which was definitely a top secret or a very effective bombing device for its day, uh, is complete and that is an original one there. You can even look down through the site <coughs> right on top there and actually see the crosshairs for it. Uh, off to your left were actually your bombing controls, so you've got airspeed indicators, a lot of the pilot instruments, and it's not all populated, but this is where you actually controlled your salvo that you were deploying out of the airplane over there. Which one is the bomb release switch? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> so Frank, who we've aptly named the bomb guy, is going to run us quickly through the specifics of uh, bomb ordnance uh, particularly. So what can you tell us about what's here? Um, we've, this is the forward bomb bay on a B-29. There were two bomb bays forward and behind the wing. Um, they could carry 10,000 pounds in each bomb bay for a 20,000 pound total payload. Two to three of these bomb racks were down each side of each bomb bay. On dock, we've got these two giving you an uh, uh, example of the most common ordnance that B-29s carried. Thousand pounder up here on the top right, which would have been filled with TNT. 500 pounder on the top left with tritonol. 
and the bottom is a 250-pounder with Comp B. Those were the two, three most common uh, compositions that you were used inside the bombs. Um, they were released. If I get, there's a there's a bomb shackle, and then the fingers on the little bomb release were electronic, and they have two fingers. And when a normal release, one finger pulls, releases the bomb from the shackle, but the safety wire that goes through the fuse stays on the shackle, pulls through the fins at the front and sometimes on the back. The 500 pounder has an aft fuse as well. Then those spinners spin so many turns and that arms the bombs. In the event you needed to salvo the bombs, you were say losing an engine at low altitude and you needed to get rid of all that weight quickly. The other finger moves and the bombs are released in mass and the safety wire stays with the bomb so the fuses don't go live. They just slide down the rack, obviously the fire extinguisher and the tow bar weren't there at the time uh, and they just fall down. Uh, B-29s, the bomb board doors are operated by air so they snap open in one second and they close in about a second and a half. So the airplane stays clean and fast right up to the point of bomb release. And when you're on a bomb run uh, and, and the bomber finds his target, um, is it one bomb at a time or do they drop all together as well? Uh, they would normally drop in a sequence, fore and aft, um, sometimes left and right, but typically you'd drop one or two from the forward bomb bay and one or two at the rear bomb bay to keep the aircraft in balance, but they were falling quickly behind each other. Okay. So. How does the bomb know when to detonate? And does it have anything to do with the two fuses, the, the little so propellers? So the, the fuses are one of a number of types. So contact type, it goes off once it hits something. There's a time delay, so when it hits, say, the roof of a, of a structure, the, the bomb will go off before it hits the ground. So there's a minuscule delay, you know, parts of tenths of a second. Uh, and then there are other bombs with full time delays. They bury themselves in the ground, they sit there for hours and then they go off. Uh, but the most common is either a contact or a, a short delay. Our ordnance guys in the, uh, the U.S. and the Pacific particularly, they knew the timing from the roof of the building till the ground and they would time the bomb to go off about halfway to two-thirds of the way to the ground. So the concussive effect was much more widespread in the structure and would just destroy everything inside rather than just make a crater. So That's cool. And talk about the stripes. So the colored stripes reference the type of explosive material that was inside. TNT with a single stripe, Comp B with the twin stripes, Tritonol with the three stripes. They were various combinations of TNT, um, RDX, well, what was the, wasn't RDX back then, but uh, the early form of a plastic explosive. Yeah. Uh, sawdust or wax were, were used to either create a slower explosion or an instantaneous. Again, it was all determined by what the ordnance guys needed for that particular mission and what their target was. The bombs didn't have the fins. Uh, they were just the shell, no fuses yet. Uh, and they were sitting in literally in huge piles at various points you know, around the airfields. So the armament guy could take a set of binoculars and he could look at these piles of ordnance and just from the stripes he could determine what type of bomb they were and where he was going to need to go get, get those types. And then they were pulled, fins and fuses were added. Fuses quite often were added once it was in the bomb, bomb bay. Um, the large bomb here, you can see some kind of rusty red stripes. So there were two cast iron rings that slid over the bombs and then they could roll them around and they would leave a rusty ring. So uh, I put that on the, oh. our, our demo bomb so people can get a... The yellow stripe was indicative of where the single shackle was for those bombs that had both the two, two shackle and the single points. Because mm -hmm. the Navy used single points. So there were a lot of ordnance that was available to either the Navy or the Army Air Corps. And then, yeah, if we can go to nuclear first, quickly talk about, we. they know they had to modify the plane to take the two nukes, do you know how much? So, uh, the biggest modification in the bomb bay was they took eight inches out of the bottom of the tunnel, they just squared it off, it was still sealed, uh, and then the shackle mounted there because both the nuclear bombs were single point shackles. 
Now, the U.S. did not have a shackle capable of carrying a 10,000-pound bomb, so we barred them from the British because the British used the Grand Slam and uh, tall man bombs that were 12 and 14,000 pounds. So uh, the bombs were too big to roll in underneath the aircraft, so they were on a dolly that went down into a pit. The airplanes were pushed over the pit. The dolly was raised up, bringing the bomb into the bomb bay, mounted on the shackle, and then returned down. Uh, as a sleight of hand, once the bomb bay doors were closed, ordnance officers went in and changed the antennas that were part of the proximity fuse on both nuclear bombs. We put the wrong antennas on so that the enemy spies that might get a picture would get a picture of the wrong equipment and make jamming devices on the wrong frequency. <laughs> so uh, our guys were pretty shrewd. <laughs> we're going to talk about special type of bombs, special weapons, and there's one key that stands out, which is? Uh, the incendiary bombs were used basically from March of 45 through the end of the war. Most of the industrial targets had been well destroyed by that point, but it was a cottage industry. Uh, most of the structures were paper and wood, and the best way to do that was through incendiary weapons. Our most common incendiary weapon was the size of the thousand pounder with a blunt nose, and it was a canister filled with 62 bomblets, either phosphorus or uh, uh, napalm. Those bombs would fall to a certain altitude. The canister would open up, scattering the bomblets all over the place. Uh, often used in conjunction with general purpose and high explosive bombs, they would, they would be released at slightly different times. And normally, the second bomb would travel further than the first one. But when the canister opened up and scattered the bomblets, they lost all their forward momentum and would fall vertically, in theory, into the holes created by the high explosive bombs ahead of them. So uh, we had a pattern set up to create the firestorms. Three days in Tokyo was 180,000 casualties. Both nuclear strikes together were 120,000. So uh, military estimates, 210 bombers could have done the same destruction as one nuke. So this airplane is 99 feet long. It's got a 141 foot wingspan. The flap here, that runs just outboard of the engine is 40 feet long. There's a 25 foot long aileron out here. I don't know which way is better for your camera. I guess it really doesn't matter. I can make it work, whatever. Coming out here and we're going to give you an idea of just how big this wing's going to be. Don't fall off. Shit. Wow. Look at that. Is there a reason there's a matte finish with the paint on the wings and in the center there? Yes, there is. So the the wing here and across the center line is actually a different alloy. So this is a different alloy of metal and it's more susceptible to corrosion. So it can't be left unpainted and exposed mm -hmm. in this airplane. It spends a lot of time outside on tour. Right. So. That's why the fuselage through the cells are polished and look pretty, and this is painted. Okay, there you go. This is my favorite part of the tour. Of course, most people won't do it. We got it. the VIP tour. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so where we're standing right now is where the fuel tank starred right here. Okay, so this is the way. These are actually the covers for the bolt extensions for the outer wing. All right, the fuel tank starts here and runs to the same spot on the other side. Okay. All right, this thing holds 5,400 gallons of fuel. Hold. And then during the war, too, they also had Bombay fuel tanks that they could load up in there to extend the range even further out. Okay. So on a full bomb load, this thing had a 3,000 mile range. So this is a Curtis Wright 3350. Uh, incredibly power in powerful engine, especially for its day, but it was also, just like the airframe, not ready for service. Uh, major problems with, with oiling systems, with cooling systems on the airplane. And the, that engine probably took out more B-29s than the enemy did. Uh, so throughout the, the war, just the short time that this airplane was in service for those two years, uh, they had done over 3,000 modifications to this engine, trying to extend Ooh. its life and trying to bring it into service. So you could plan when this thing went into service, you're only going to get about 50 hours out of that engine before it comes apart. 
towards the end of the war they had got that those hours up to around 200 250 hours per engine mm -hmm. but you see all the pictures of b-29s out there in the south pacific and the piles of engines that are out there pay attention when you flip through the books and you'll, yeah. you'll see wow. that it was uh, it, it, the, these engines just destroyed themselves so it's 3,350 cubic inches today. It's around 2,000 horsepower. It's considerably higher back in the day because they were running 145 octane fuel. They had two turbo tur two turbochargers plus a massive uh, centrifugal supercharger on the back. Today we are only running that supercharger, not the turbocharger. We're running on 100 low lead gas. So these things right now today are making about 2,000 horsepower apiece. Okay. What what's the the purpose of the uh, retractable uh, flaps here? All right, so what what you'll see with this, so this is an air-cooled engine. All right, I'm yep. sure you have some of the tanks you've dealt with have radial, radial engines yep. in them. Yep. Okay. So how do you cool the cylinders on them? And so what it is is ram air from the direction of flight mm -hmm. comes over those cylinders, and as the air comes through, you need to regulate the amount of airflow through that. So if it's running hot, I'll open the doors up and allow more cooling air through that. As the cylinders start getting too cold, you start bringing the doors closed to, to, to slow oh. down the, air, the amount of air going over the cylinders, and that's how you regulate the temperature of the engine. So you have that concept, you can actually stack air inside that compartment? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. And um, it's the first uh, bomber that's gone to a uh, four-bladed prop. What is the reason and the advantages of that? Uh, I. So again, don't hold me to this because I don't know my Marauders and a lot of other airplanes. I thought that this, I'm not sure that this is the first four blade of prop. I'm thinking like the heavy bombers, but yeah, okay. go, go ahead. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it is definitely that, the, the heavy um, bomber. So if you've got enough more blades on it, I mean, you're going to push more air, right? But you've got to right. have the power to drive that. Okay. So these, these propellers, 16 feet, 7 inch diameter propeller, they weigh just under a ton apiece. And they're going to spin at 2,400 RPM on takeoff roll. Wow. And they're hamstanded uh, props too? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. Each of these engines actually behind each individual engine has got 85 gallon oil tank. Mm. Wow. Today we'll run, normally we'll keep it around 70 gallons, about okay. where it's at right now. So there is literally a ton of oil on this airplane. Wow. Let's talk about the all right, so this is your flap drive here, and what this other motor is up here is a, a backup to this one. So if your main control dies, the six person I mentioned in the back would come mm -hmm. forward and you can actually toggle and power the flaps down with this auxiliary motor. Okay. All right, so if we have, then you'll see when we go through the landing gear, you'll see there's a massive motor very similar to this to drive the gear down, the main landing gear down. Mm -hmm. So for whatever reason that motor fails, for whatever reason, right. you, if you're the sixth guy, you would come back through here and you would uncouple this motor in this drive right here that connects out to the main landing gear. So you've got an extension and you've got a retraction side and should whatever reason you have to pull the gear up to do that. Okay. Just start through the whole process from the beginning. So the crew would come in here. Yep. All right, and, and um, it was either, it was normally the center fire gun controller, which we'll get to in a minute, that'll fire up the auxiliary power unit. So this is a two cylinder, 32 cubic inch uh, air cooled uh, auxiliary power unit with a 200 amp starter generator on it. So this, they would use the battery power to fire this thing up, and this is what would provide power for the ship on the ground, for us to start oh. the engines and to operate um, while we're going through climb out till I can get all six generators online. So this is what powered the beast, okay? Today we don't use it, we use these three batteries back here, but battery technology today wasn't what it was 75 right. years ago. Okay, so we'd come in and we would start this thing up. Um, we'll get to the tail gutter here in a minute then. So the rest of us, we would come forward. <coughs> So in here, in this compartment, feel free to take up any of these seats you guys want to here. Back here, there were two side gunners here and the scanner bubbles here. And up here is where the center fire gun controller was here. So he was the master controller who had control of what guns, and we'll talk about that system here in a minute. Back where you guys are at, there would have been boats. If the aircraft was equipped with a bombing radar, it would have been where these flight suits are at right now, where his desk and scope was at. Okay. So this was your back end crew. Okay, and um, we've 
I heard that there's like a there was like a sleeping compartment in the big yeah. So line. that's where these guys would have been here. There was a there were boats that folded down right there where they're at. They would normally be up against the fuselage and they would just fold down. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, what would happen here? As you said, this is a first pressurized bomber. So mm -hmm. you can see the pressure vessel here. This was the aft pressure vessel. And then where we walked through was unpressurized. We get all the way back to the tail gunner's position. There were actually bleed air tubes that went from this vessel to the aft compartment to pressurize the tail gunner back there. Okay. So once they took off and they got up to where they were starting to pressurize, the tail gunner would have to go to the back, close this bulkhead door, and then he was he was back there for the duration of the mission until they descended and pressurized. Wow. So a, a question on the, the pressurization. Um, we're at a stage of the war where, where by adding the pressurization, it's created more complexity to the aircraft. But what advantages does having the pressurized compartments offer as opposed to the old? So you provided crew comfort, you provided higher altitudes, you know, you're not on oxygen, you're not operating in sub-zero degrees temperatures. Um, and this thing was flying at 33,000 feet mm -hmm. at, the, at the beginning when they started utilizing until they brought it down to low altitude bombing. And for those that don't know, how do they create, like back then, how do they create that pressure? So the way that they did this is the inboard engines actually had an additional turbocharger on the back end of it. It was kind of just a power takeoff of the engine. And what it would do is that those supercharger turbochargers would bleed air into the uh, into the uh, into this 40 foot long tube that connected the two main pressure vessels of the airplane. Mm -hmm. And then the flight engineer would set the cabin altitude. And then what regulated that are these valves that you see up here. Those were the outflow valves. And okay. that would dictate your cabin altitude. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And so your gunners, this is actually the original window here. It would have had an optic sight in there. And what it is, it was much like using a camera. So you would zoom in focus the target mm -hmm. and up front and we'll, we'll go through this up there the navigator would speed it would load in their airspeed altitude temperature and that information was fed into targeting computers that were under the floor here under these boards there have been several targeting computers and what what they would do is those analog computers would calculate the seven parameters needed to hit a moving target from a moving target and as you zoomed in on that and pull the trigger whatever turret you were in control of, whether it was the one above would be that been above our head or back there or the two in the front, mm -hmm. you the guns would swing and it was like playing a video game. Yeah. Okay. And you'll see redundant control cables in this, which you don't see in the twenty four and the seventeen. Okay. So do they even though they're redundant, they work together and then Yeah they, they do. So say the aircraft is damaged on that side and you lose the co pilot controls, the pilots still can control the flight control surfaces. So, okay. So when you talk today's aviation standards, that that's not only normal, that's required. Right. Back then it wasn't. So again, a lot of innovations in this airplane. Mm -hmm. yeah. so here's the drive motor for the gear. Okay. So just like we talked about inside, should this fail for whatever reason. Your job as that scanner would be to come in and use that that alternative motor or the hand crank to get the gear down. But again, very B-17 ish. It's yeah. very standard Boeing stuff. And then you've got that's a hydraulic up there. No, so up up there are actually originally there would have been CO2 fire extinguishers. Today oh. we, we use Halon, but those are the fire bottles for the engines. Okay. So should there be a fire in any of the accessory sections of either engine on either side of the airplane, I can fire one or both of those bottles at it. So now, down here, we're not dealing with... We're definitely dealing with a heavy structure and heavy force rather than trying to keep things lightweight. So you can see, like, uh, on the tanks, like, I have absolutely no doubt that's arc weld, like, stick welding. Oh, yeah. I and, um, it, yeah. Because so. I don't think they had the MiG technology back then. Well, um, <clears throat> pretty standard whether it's a tank, a battleship, an airplane, this is what you saw with the heavy structures. Yeah. Yeah, this is very, again, very B-17-ish. This, this acne screw extends, gear folds in half, there's the up lock up there. These massive wheels and tires come up in the wheel while we're standing. And then you have Schrader valve on the yeah. mast there, what's that? Is that... So that's for the oleo strut, actually, for this. And that's pretty, pretty standard aviation industry stuff. It's a nitrogen charge over hydraulic fluid. Oh, really? Yeah. Same thing B-17 has, B-24 has. 
And who, uh, what time, who did the tires? Was it Goodyear or? Uh, Dunlop actually does these for us now. Okay. They used to make a run every year, uh, then it got to be every other year, because a lot of, like the Neptunes, a lot of the other radial fire bombers from back mm -hmm. in the day would use these as well. And the, the kind of a collective would just come together and everybody would buy some of the tires. But nowadays, since all those airplanes are retired, not being used, mm -hmm. tire runs are far and fewer in between. So is the 17, the 24, and the 29 operators would pull together when Dunlop is going to gonna make it worth their while to do a production run on the tires. So I don't see like a typical tire has your tread wear indicator like uh... So depending on the tire that you have on the airplane and whether it's a new tire or whether it's a retread, there's different tech data requirements for it. And so so it, you, it's actually, you can retread a it, plane tire? As long as you don't destroy the carcass. Okay. So it, it's measurements that you'll take and just depends on the tire and just measure your tread now. Okay. There is no steering wheel to steer this airplane on the ground. This steering, the nose gear here, works just like a caster on an office chair. Oh, wow. Yeah, it has 66 degrees of travel. Uh -huh. All right, and so when you taxi this airplane or you're going down the runway, you have to use the brakes to steer this thing. All right, you want to turn right, hit the right brake, and it goes that way. Or you use differential power powering up the outboard engines. You want to turn right, crank up the number one engine, it'll blow us around the, the, the turn. Hmm. So that, that, that's how you steer this monster on the ground. And even on takeoff, well, what will normally happen is the pilots will get us out there, I'll do the run up, we'll get staged, they get the airplane lined up and set, set the brakes. I'll set initial takeoff power, and they'll take hold of the throttles and work up the number one and four throttle to get this thing steered down the runway until it's going fast enough for them to use the rudder, and then they'll call the throttles back to me, and then I'll take off over. Okay. That's a, yeah, this thing's a handful in every regard, every, every Yeah, way. just looking at it, it's, it's pretty simple to understand. It's just got the stop points. Yeah, you've got like, the stops here. Yeah. There's a centering cam inside of here because you can't have the wheels turn as you take off and then retract them. They've got to fit oh. straight in here. So if you're slightly off as you take off, the centering cam will straighten the wheels and then pull them in. And then as you land or going, this is a shimmy damper here, which is basically just a shock absorber to keep the wheel from fluttering as you huh. get on, go down the, uh, the runway. And is there a reason um, we've got the tread pattern like a little more beefier at the front as opposed to the landing gear up at the back? Uh, it's actually pretty close to the same thing. These are actually uh, just like a unapproved runway type Okay. Surface here. I mean, a lot of the runways they were operating off of were made out of coral. It wasn't mm -hmm. concrete that they were flying off of, and that's what you would have seen. Okay. Cool. And it had a 13 half inch diameter centrifugal supercharger on the back of it, which we still have today. And this housing area right here was one turbocharger, and then the same thing on the inboard side of each engine. So you had two massive turbos plus the supercharger, and then the inboard ones had that turbocharger to um, pressurize the aircraft. Okay. So today we don't fly with with um, the turbochargers. They're expensive. They're fire prone. We don't pressurize. We're fair weather flyers. So plus we're running 100 low lead. In fact, the whole thing's not even there. If you look up in here, we try to keep the appearance of the aircraft as original as possible. So it's just a pass through tube. All of the exhaust comes out what used to be the wastegate now. Oh. So again, just to simplify, if we're going to operate this airplane and give ride flights, make it to shows, we've got to build in reliability. Yeah, absolutely. So when people take pictures of it, they see the original configuration of B-29. However, a lot of things behind the scenes we've done to try and improve the reliability. Yeah, we, we kind of do the same thing. <laughs> okay, yeah. so you know what I'm talking yeah. about. So the, the turbos, just the spools got it out of it? or, or it No, there just... isn't anything. Oh, so on Fifi, we still fly with the housings and these still function with exhaust. On dock, we don't do that. That's just a, uh, can you see the through pipe through there? Oh, oh, wow. Did, so, you, get, did you get a shot of that? I think, let me do another one. They That's like the, rerouted the exhaust like through the turbo. It just completely bypasses everything and everything comes out what would have been the wastegate. Now, that's why Fifi and Doc sound a little different, even though they're the same engines. Huh. But I don't have to deal with these things cracking and trying to find somebody on the road that can weld yeah, brittle yeah. ass old metal. Yeah, and you can see like right here is like what time they've they've like spot welded, and I don't know whether they would have tacked it in place and then spot welded to finish it up. I'm not sure, but wow. 
That's awesome. Some of the other secrets of this thing, we talked about the original engines are just not reliable. So when we were flying Fifi, it was 2006, we put our last spare on the airplane mm. of the original engines. They were fuel injected. Again, problem 75 years ago. So imagine how they are today. Right, right. Um, anyway, we ended up losing that engine just over five hours later. Oh. So what do you what do? You do? So long story short, what ended up happening with these 3350s, after the war, a lot of the problems, the problems with the oiling system, a lot of the cooling system problems that they had, they were able to engineer out of the engine and turn it into an extremely reliable engine. They were used on all kinds of military and civilian aircraft. Mm -hmm. So that's great, but now move forward to today, the problem is that they don't fit a B-29. All right, the original B-29, when you guys go back and have time, look at some of the original pictures and what you'll notice in the front here, you won't see cylinders, you'll see a huge ring there. And what that was, the front cylinder exhaust exited the front, the rear cylinder exited the rear. All right, sounds simple enough, right? But like we talked about, there's cooling air being rammed into there that would have to run over that exhaust, right, before it got to the cylinder. It's not very effective. So what we did is we took, we figured out that the back end of an engine off the of Sky Raider, uh, Dash 26 WD, it actually bolted to the wing box of our airplane, and it had the drives that we needed. And if you combine that with the rotating assembly and the nose cave case off a of Dash 95W, actually we took them off some AC-119s, mm -hmm. and combined those together, almost like Mitch Match and small block Chevy parts, we ended up with an engine that actually could fit inside this nacelle and that we could run this massive propeller on. All right, instead of having to go to shorter props or change the nacelle, we got it fit in there. So, like I say, those engines now, the exhaust on both rows of cylinders exits out the back. So there's a, a header that was fabricated, so you don't see the ring up there anymore, right? So yeah. it all exits through the back. Through here, through custom collectors that come through there. It makes the transition back and then it picks up the original swivel joint through here, through the bypass hose that we built here. So again, every person here taking pictures are taking pictures of an original configuration. It's just you don't see the headers in the, the that's, uh, front header. That's genius. And then the, the airplane originally had a high tension ignition system. Do you guys ever deal with any of those in the tanks? So they're pieces of crap trying to deal with high tension magnetos. So these are actually, this is a low tension ignition system. So what we did is you'll see the distributors. See that up there? Oh, yeah. This one over here. You see how we cut the cooling panels to fit them up inside oh. there? So now we did away with the high tension magnetos and, the, and now, again, built more reliability into the system. So credit to you guys for doing that because you have the, you have a lot of the rivet counting purists out there that would be upset, but the reality is, um, if you want to fly this thing, that was the only way to do it's, it. It's the only way to do it. Like so, we this was actually what we did um, on Fifi, and so when it came time for engines for Doc, we just cut and paste the same. Right, because it works. It works. Yeah. So any cylinder can compress all the air you want to with it, right? But you can't compress fluids, all right? <laughs> so with this engine, and again, we mentioned that we're carrying today 70 gallons of oil behind it. When you look at two rows of nine cylinders all the way around that oil can get trapped in those cylinders so again half your cylinders are upside down and so if you don't what we've got to do is actually pull the propeller blades through and what we're looking to do is to cycle that through and make sure that we don't have that buildup of oil that will cause a hydrostatic lock and because when that does happen you're either going to remove a cylinder or you're going to bend a connecting rod yeah which again is pretty catastrophic yeah. problem so we'll cycle these things through it gives you two full rotations of this through the reduction gear so it makes sure that every cylinder clears. And I'll do that every time before I start the engines on this. Uh, and you'll notice that most Warbird operators pull these through by hand. The B-29 is a little bit different. We don't have the original inertia starters on this thing anymore. So, but what we do have is a starter that has a clutch on it. Okay. And so, and it's not just because we're lazy, but you and I pulling on this massive propeller have actually enough strength and enough leverage with this monstrous thing to cause damage to the engine if we encounter a oh, lock really? ourselves. Oh. So I use the starter. I know it makes me look lazy, but there's a purpose behind it because as it starts feeling the resistance, it'll actually disengage from the crankshaft and stop the rotation of the engine.
Okay, so we're going to start number three. We'll start three, four, and then two, one. And what we're going to do here, how this works, is open the throttle. You need to crack open enough to get enough air to start it. Too much air, it backfires it as it leans out. Steve laughs at me. Electric boost pump's going to come on. That's going to send fuel out to the nacelle, both through a priming solenoid that will inject fuel directly into the supercharger as well as fuel to the carburetor. All right, ignition's going to come on, and I'm going to start rotating three. And as three starts rotating, the ignition comes to life. I'm going to start injecting fuel into it. Two. Start Four, getting some gas. Six. Eight. Now that it's stabilized, we're going to bring the carburetor in and get the carburetor working. And the high-tech way you know the carburetor is working is when the fuel comes from the second source, it's going to flood the engine and you're going to watch the attack drop. So I bring this in, see the transition? That tells us the carburetor is now flowing fuel. I'm off the primer. The engine should recover. We turn the electric boost pump off. Engine-driven pump working. We just do that three more times. Easy enough? Have to start checklist. Okay, AVX master switch. It's on. The instrument AC power. It's on. ICS com select. On one. And verify. Engineer's inverter. Primary. Engine instruments. Check. Docks. Stowed. Ladder. Stowed in the front. Stowed aft. Ground communication. ICS has been removed. Okay, checklist complete. So we are here at uh, the Inukon Airport, California, very, very close to the China Lake facility where Doc was recovered. Uh, we are very honored to speak with the gentleman, uh, Sammy Forward, who is the man responsible for pulling Doc out of China Lake. So, hi Sammy, welcome. Hello. Tell us when you first saw Doc. I had to do things with the put them up targets, and I did all kinds of things. So I got out there to do that, and I seen the dock, and I just could not uh, destroy it. So I had some people come out, and they pulled it in next to a, a big building, and but it sat there for the 20 years or something like that. Wow. And people would come through and they'd always get on it and play around with it and do this and that, you know. We took it off the base and they took it and they were going to try to uh, put it back together, get it going again. But it just was a short time and they said, no, we can't do it. So they took it back to where it uh, was built two times. I went to see how it was doing. And, and the first time I went, it was just scattered. I mean, they had <laughs> everything just scattered out. And uh, so, that was really neat to get to see that. At a later time, I went back to it, and it was just awesome what they had done to it. And, and uh, it, you could tell it was gonna be uh, done right. Well, um, you know, this is part of what we do. This is our job and our passion and restoration passion and to meet someone who goes a lot further back than our generation, uh, not only with military service, but you've done an incredible achievement for the restoration and the, the warbird community. So it was a pleasure talking with you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, hydraulic pump emergency switch. On and armed. Hydraulic pressure. Two normal. Hydraulic quantity. Two and a quarter gallons. Part break. It's set. Ducks. We're gonna move. Gap flaps. Open. Oil coop. Open. Generators on, engineers inverters off, pedo heats off, fuel shutoff switches checked open, depth detect lights checked, magneto switch off, fuel barrel uh, 27 ish, propeller highlights front, highlights engineer, flight control lock, unlock, and flight control deck. Ailerons, right aileron down, right aileron up, 
Elevator. Elevator up. Elevator down. And rudder. Rudder right. Rudder left. Thank you. Free and correct. Okay, check those complete. Any current traffic, stock 72, B29, Zoom Fortress, taxiing out to uh, runway 33, we'll taxi down Bravo, back taxi down runway 220. And any current traffic, stock 72, Zoom Fortress, we are back taxi in runway 2, any current. Alright, so what I'm doing now is I'm going to just run the engines up a little load on these and what I'm going to do is cycle the propellers through their full pitch travel and you'll hear as they start changing pitch and taking a bigger bite out of the air the RPMs of the engine you'll hear them come down. You hear how that draws the engine out just by changing the blade angle. Go on down. Slide the blades back out and you'll hear the RPMs come back up. Alright Steve, engine run up is complete. Okay, before takeoff, trip tab. One, two, three, seven, left. Set on the right. Propellers. Highlights in the front. Highlights engineer. Flaps. Set 15. Switch off and guarded. Climb power. Big set at climb two. Engine instruments checked. Pastures are clear to move around. harmonic rum and rumble in the airplane. Yeah. Alright, so what that's telling you is that propellers aren't synchronized. They're not all four spinning at the same speed. So I've got a sync pack that'll give me half as close. But if you watch out your window out there, look out your window, see where that yellow arc is? See where that shadow's passing through there? So depending on what side of the airplane you're on and what direction that shadow's going tells me if that propeller's going faster or slower than the other one. So you'll watch as I speed up number two, get it in sync. Um, the shadow disappears. Thank you. See how the rumble's gone now into the airplane? Oh, I went too far. You can sync it with your camera too, Sky. You can see the, get it at the right angle. So now they're spinning at the same speed. Then when Ken turns the airplane, it starts all over again. Scratch <laughs> climb a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Clearly, your poor traffic area in Kern Valley today. So as we climb, you end up putting more power in as you descend. You pull power back. There's no mechanical control for that other than just your throttles. Right. Then your temperatures are, these two are all manually operated. So those big flaps on the side of the engine, as they open up, those are our, our cylinder head cooling flaps. Cow flaps are what they do. So if I want to bring up like number three is getting too low, so yeah, what I'll do is I'll bring number, lower three, area right over there. bring number three closed. You know, watch here. Back to me. And these yeah. are a little slow, they don't react instantly. It's a lot of guesswork. So you bring them closed, you be patient, and then you just trend the temperature where they're going. And it's the same thing with the oil. The oil cooling doors are on the bottom of the air. Six spot truck, we snow. are taxiing out of transient parking. So it's going to taxi for runway zero two. We're going to bring those doors closed a little bit. And then we're going to wait and see how the temperature reacts to it. And as we change direction, when we climb or dive, we can readjust them all over again.
watch. Again's going to start descending, so you can watch it on the altimeter start coming down. But watch how the manifold pressure will rise because we're getting into thicker air. So as we get into thicker air, you can see see them come up, and that's why this takes constant adjustment. So see how it's already edging off the 28. Now we're already at 28 and a half. So this is yeah, this is the the throttles. This is what controls that. So while he's descending, I need to be pulling the throttles back to maintain that power setting. Okay, let's go gear down. Blow line. Oil coolers open. Cap left set. Mixtures switch. Swiss pump slow. Hydraulic pump cut off. On and arm. Fasters. Happy the front. Fasters. See you in the back. Propellers. 2000. And she's out to verify. Okay, three green. Go flat 15.
this is the most manliest moisturizing agent you can get. Hand moisturizer lotion from a uh, freshly run B29. Yeah. Our target audience agrees. All right, so we're cutting into these guys' time at beer o'clock, and I just want to say one thing about the aircraft community here. You guys are so open to uh, sharing your craft, and everyone we've approached that Oshkosh has has opened the doors and let us in to get amazing footage, and um, we'll make some incredible videos with that. So I can't thank you enough. It's been thank a pleasure. Thank you guys for doing that. I'm sure just like with what you guys do, it's about the passion, you know, Absolutely. and about why Absolutely. we do what we do. All right, thank, thank you, you, Donnie. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching, guys.